It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And I really enjoy that song. You know, what indeed a day that would be. Yes. Oh man. And all this is over. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I tell you, things are getting worse in our world. I mean, I don't know if you know this. I mean, you can't help but notice unless you live under a rock. Mm. I mean, I think even if you live under a rock, mm. you're still here. Mm. You're still be crying out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's literally no hiding place. No hiding place. The only hiding place is in Jesus. Amen. The only hiding place is in Jesus. And I don't have to paint a picture or paint a picture for you as to how bad things are in our world today. But I want us to have hope because we stand at a crucial time in our history. I mean, the, the prophets of old long to stand where we stand. Yes. Hmm. We are on the brink of eternity. Jesus is soon to come. Oh boy. The hope of all ages. I mean, what we have desired for all these ages is about to happen. I mean, I, I, I heard the older folks talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't think that it would be in my lifetime. <laughs> I really didn't think so. I mean, I've heard the prophecies and read the prophecies, and but I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. Yeah. And I'm saying to us, just hold on. Yeah. Hold to Jesus. Yes. Whatever the, the enemy has planned, He's going to execute. We just need to hold on to Jesus. We have an advocate. Let us kneel in prayer. Our gracious Father. We thank you and praise your name for you have been nothing but good to us. You have kept us all our life and even all through this week. You have provided. You have blessed. You have taken us out of situations. You have prevented us from getting into situations. You have given mercy and grace in time of need. You are faithful to your word. And you have brought us into this oasis in time called the Sabbath. Where we understand that you are God and we are your creation. We understand that we are dependent upon you. And so we pray even now that as we enter into this fellowship and communion with you, we humble our hearts and we say, Lord, speak. For we are listening. Bless us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to our scripture reading. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. It's important that we, we, we get accustomed to not just hearing, but, but 
literally reading God's word. There's a blessing in the reading. Okay? Yeah. So the Bible says in, in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what is it that John is writing unto us so that we wouldn't sin? What is it that John is saying to us that he's writing these things so that we wouldn't sin? Is it possible for us to live and not sin? So what is it that would keep us from sin? If we were to take a jump up into chapter 1, we would see where John begins. John says in verse 1 of chapter 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it. I don't know if we are pausing to, 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 to capture what John is saying. John said that we have heard. Anybody heard? Yes. John says that we have seen with our own eyes. Anybody seen? We have looked upon. There's a difference between seeing and looking upon now. Right? And which we have handled. What is this that John is talking about? John uses a phrase that he used before. Right? Yeah, that word of life. But he talks about from the beginning. It the ah, it was that very John who wrote, in the beginning was the word. Right? So John is talking about a personal experience with Jesus, the word of life. John is saying that we have had personal experience with Jesus. Brother Shade, we need to have personal experience glory, glory. with Jesus. Amen. Amen. And it is key in what he begins chapter 2 with. My little children, these things are right unto you that ye sin not. Because two can't walk together except they be agreed. agreed. So if we are walking in with Jesus, we say not. John is saying that it is possible for us to live in this present world without sinning. Of course. Amen. Amen. Absolutely, unequivocally possible. However, John is not leaving out the possibility of us failing, falling. And John says... And if any man sin, or if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. There are many times when we would need an advocate. I'm sure that those who would have lost their job wish that they had an advocate at that time. Somebody who would stand up and say, no, you can't do this. So 
So what is an advocate? An advocate is someone who stands and speaks in favor of someone or a cause. Right? When in the famous case of O.J. Simpson, when he was on the run, this is international. This is made international news. I mean, I'm not speaking of anything that we are not uh, familiar with, right? Not that I'm bringing attention to this, but I, I want us to understand something. All the evidence, as far as we are concerned, pointed to O.J.'s guilt. Hmm. But O.J. retained an advocate hmm. who was considered one of the best and these words were made famous by that advocate come on <laughs> against all the evidence Cochrane said if the glove doesn't fit all right I mean some of us would wish that we had such an advocate now we're not here to declare you know innocence or guilt of any person right all we're talking about is the fact that he had an advocate somebody who understood law understood how the courts work understand the happenings behind the scenes understand how to paint a picture And so, he was able to get O.J. Simpson off the hook. But this advocate that we're talking about, of course, is Jesus Christ. He's a different kind of advocate. No person who have ever come to him have ever lost a case. None who have trust in him has ever go away wanting, mm. brother Shane. Yes, yes. And there are many who have been found guilty because they had a poor advocate or had no advocate. But here we see Jesus in verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins I don't know if you got that oh yes <laughs> in other words we are guilty yes. Yes. amen most big time lawyers or big name lawyers would not take a case if they know they can't win it. Uh, you didn't get that? Yes. Alright, but Jesus is taking our case. Mm -hmm. And we are guilty. How do you know we can't win it? Alright. Okay. How? <laughs> when 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 we are told in this court the even the very secret things. The very thoughts of our minds are brought into scrutiny. They can't do that in an earthly case. No. They can't go into your head. No. Right? No. And the things that you have done secretly, they may not know. No. But heaven knows. Mm -hmm. So how is Jesus going to win? Because he becomes the very propitiation for our sins. He takes the guilt in order that we may go free. Amen. Now, what an advocate. Amen. 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 And he wants to do that for each of us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Right. Because he's not only the propitiation for our sins, he's a propitiation for the sins of the world. whole world. Which means that everybody has an opportunity to make it to heaven, to make it to glory. Hmm. Everybody. So how does Jesus look?
as our advocate. How does that scene in the courtroom look? Can we know? Where is that? Where is our case being decided? Some people, you know, I mean, and some advocates are good. They, 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 they push for the case to be held at a, a, a place where they know they will get a more favorable outcome. You know what I'm talking about? Where they feel like the, the bias will be in their favor. <laughs> where the jurors look more like... Are you understanding what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. But in this court scene, there's none of that. Yeah, <laughs> the courtroom is out of this world. There's no bias there. Amen. Come on. Amen. Think for a moment. I, I want to really reach you in your mind. Because this has everything to do with our salvation. So this courtroom is set up, has been set up, right? Since 1844. Right? I saw a tale thrones were cast down and the ancient of days they sit. Alright. The books were open. And each case is being dealt with. Alright. So it behoves us to pay attention as to what is happening in that courtroom is what I'm saying. Amen. Could you imagine if OJ was eh, least concerned in his courtroom case? They would have read that as against him. He doesn't have any remorse. He doesn't look like he's interested. He might be guilty. Because everything is read, right? Mm. So how do we participate in this court scene, this court session where we are being examined. How? How? And how do we, we aid our advocate in, 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 in presenting our case? Do we have any record or any example as to how Jesus advocates for us? I say we do. Hebrews. Ah, somebody said Hebrews. Shadrach. All right. Hebrews talks about Jesus being our high priest. And as a high priest, he advocates for us. But an often overlooked book and portion of scripture gives us a glimpse. The book of Philemon, of Philemon. Let's go there for a second. It's a very short book. Only about 25 verses. It's right before Hebrews. Let's see what we can glean from this these passages of scripture so the book begins Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy our brother unto Philemon our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. So we are introduced to this character called Philemon, right? And what we see of the bat is that he is a fellow laborer. He's dearly beloved and he's a fellow laborer. Right? And also we see that he has a church in his house. If you read the rest of um, verse 2. So Philemon is beloved, fellow servant, fellow laborer with Paul, and Paul is writing to him and also to the church in his house. And Paul says, grace to you, verse 3, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. So Philemon loves the Lord. Yes? Yes. And he loves the saints. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So Philemon doesn't just talk or profess the faith. The very bowels of the brethren are refreshed by him. Their hearts are refreshed by him. So, so what would refresh your heart? Good news. The word of God, yes. So all I need to do is to preach the word of God and you will be refreshed. Good news. Good news. Good news. Uh, uh? And attending to the needs of the brethren. Because if I say to a brother who is in need of food be thou filled and go mm. we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and I give him not those things which are needed have I ministered to him yeah. is he refreshed nope. he's still hungry yeah. but not Philemon he refreshed the bowels of the brethren Paul is saying Wherefore do I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee. Now Paul sounds like a, 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 a very skillful lawyer making a case. To me because here is Paul saying that though I might be bold in Christ when joined upon um, thee with, with that which is convenient I would rather for love's sake beseech thee so Paul is saying I, 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 could, I, could, I could tell you what to do but I would rather beseech you for love's sake and we're going to get to it. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds which in time past was to thee unprofitable but now profitable to thee and to me whom I have sent again thou therefore receive him that is in mine own bowels whom I would have retained with me that in my and in thy stead, sorry, he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me, therefore, as a partner, receive him 
as myself. If he had wronged thee, or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And he then he gives a salutation. A very interesting piece of um, oh, yes. scripture. Oh, yes. And it gives us a picture as to what Jesus looks like as an advocate. As an advocate. So how do we know that this is a, a picture of Jesus as an advocate? I mean, we see the language used. Right? There are such things where... And, and notice how Paul presents. And now, now, the backdrop of this story is that Onesimus was once a slave to Philemon. Hmm. And now, when we, when we think of slavery, I mean, it always, especially for us, brings some really, you know, um, sad connotations. Nobody wants to go there. But this was a state. Right? We're talking about the Roman Empire. And those who were wealthy had slaves. And it wasn't discriminatory. It wasn't like... Oh, they only had a particular race of slaves. No, they, they were slaves regardless of who you were. Once you were beneath them, they, you know, you were enslaved. They captured slaves from everywhere because Rome had conquered the world, right? And Onesimus was a slave of Philemon. So what happened? Philemon was converted to Christ by the labors of Paul. Right? So he now accepted Christ as his savior. And he was so faithful that, that, that he literally spent himself for the brethren. Right? He had a church in his house and he refreshed, as Paul say, the bowels of the brethren. And in other words, there was nothing too good for Philemon to do for the saints. Which is interesting. Because that is what it means to be perfect as God is perfect. Hmm. To literally love the brethren. Amen. It was that which caused God to call Job a perfect and upright man. The Bible says that the, the cause that he did not know, he sought out. Now think about it. Today, if you know a brother or sister was in need and 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 that person didn't say, we would say, well, well, how we would know to give if 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 he didn't say? Right? But that's not what Jesus did for us. Think about it. He came and sought us when we didn't even know we had a need. Enemies. Right? All right. Job was considered perfect. Job sought out the need of those who lived around him and made sure he filled it. So he didn't only did do it for people who he knew. He went searching for people who might not. He would, uh, do you have it? What would church be <laughs> if we lived Come and adopted that principle? Come on. Mm. Would there be any sadness among us? No. You think the Holy Spirit will come sooner? Yes. 
but we're talking about the advocate, right? So this is what Philemon did. And, for, well, this was, of course, Osimus uh, ran away after defrauding Philemon. Now, this is probably before Philemon was converted, right? And he had slaves. But now, how do you feel when somebody defraud you? <laughs> wow. Okay, don't, no, listen, don't answer. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, we don't have good in, in, um, thoughts of people who defraud us. I mean, unless you're Jesus, I don't know. I, I don't have good thoughts of people who defraud me. Um, but I want us to really look into what is happening or what, what transpired prior to this. So he did that and he ran away. Now, where is Paul at this time? Paul is in prison in Rome. So he finds himself in Rome. But Paul is still, you know, it doesn't matter where Paul is. Paul is about the gospel, right? Paul is a, Paul is a captive to the gospel. And Paul is going to preach the gospel wherever he go. Even if he's in shackles, he's preaching the gospel. Right? And that didn't stop Paul from writing. So Paul, even though Paul is preaching the gospel where he is, he's also writing to those who are on the outside. Refreshing the bowels of the brethren. And Paul and Onesimus part crossed. And Onesimus becomes converted. I wanted to, to, to look at the insight that we gain from Spirit of Prophecy concerning this situation, right? This is found in Acts of the Apostles. Uh, page 4, 5, 6. And this is what she says. Among those who gave their hearts to God through the labors of Paul in Rome was Onesimus, a pagan slave who had wronged his master, Philemon, a Christian believer in Colossae and had escaped to Rome. In the kindness of his heart, Paul sought to relieve the poverty and distress of the wretched fugitive, and then endeavored to shed light, the light of truth, into his darkened mind. Onesimus listened to the words of life, confessed his sins, and was converted to the faith of Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. Onesimus endeared himself to Paul. He joined himself to Paul by his piety and sincerity. That's what conversion does. It turns a dishonest man into a, a faithful and, 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 and honest man, a sincere man. So if, 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 if after being dishonest and you met Christ and you're still dishonest you might not be converted I'm just saying yes. Yes. Sounds, sounds plausible right, yes. All right good. Yes. I'm talking foolishness no less than by his tender care for the apostles comfort in other words he worked for Paul's comfort right? and his zeal in promoting the work of the gospel now notice he's not just ministering to Paul but he's involved a runaway uh, defrauding slave is now a minister of the gospel together with Paul All right. <laughs> Paul saw in him traits of character that would render him useful a useful helper in missionary labor and he counseled him to return without delay to Philman. oh my goodness <laughs> no man <laughs> You didn't hear me, right? You heard? He counseled Onesimus to return without delay to Philemon. Begged his forgiveness. In other words, he said, return to Philemon, beg his forgiveness, and plan for the future. This is what Paul is telling this new convert. 
The apostle promised to hold himself responsible for the sum which Philemon had from the for the sum for which Philemon had been robbed. Being about to dispatch Tychicus with letters to various churches in Asia Minor, he sent Onesimus with him. It was a severe test for this servant thus to deliver himself up to the master he had wronged. But he had been truly converted. Praise the Lord. I, I want us to see it. Because we're talking about an advocate. Right? So he had been truly converted and did not turn aside from duty. So when you're converted, you don't turn aside from duty. Duty is duty. Like, yeah, they, like, they, like the prophet said, that, that, that prayer does not take the place of duty. You know? Amen. Sometimes we feel that. We, we just pray it away. But if there's a duty to be performed, the one who is converted does not shy away from the duty. Glory. Paul made Osim, Osin, Onesimus sorry, the bearer of the letter to Philemon. <laughs> what do you think about it? In which with his usual tact and kindness. Uh, we, we need some of that. We need some tact. Yes. Amen. I saw. Right? We need some tact. Wisdom. Yeah. Sometimes we have something to say. It is the truth, but with no tact. Yeah. <laughs> and we undo what was supposed to be done. Mm. Right? And no kindness. We are unkind. Mm. And the funny thing is that we expect kindness. <laughs> Listen, the gospel of Jesus makes us kind. Amen. So he sent him with the, the bane and the bearer of this letter, in which, with his usual tact and kindness, the apostle pleaded the cause of the repentant slave and express a desire to retain his services in the future. The letter began with an affectionate greeting to Philemon as a friend and fellow laborer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in, which is in you in Christ Jesus. Amen. The apostle reminded Philemon that every good purpose and trait of character which he possessed was due to the grace of Christ. Amen. 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 Yes. Uh, no, no, you... you, you, you. <laughs> Philemon was now this compassionate man. This man who refreshed the bowels of the brethren. But he owed this good trace that he had now had to the grace of Christ. Amen. So he was indebted to Christ. Amen. And that is what Paul is appealing to. Mm. Hmm. All right. Amen. Amen. I, I, I'm talking about being an advocate Amen. and Jesus as our advocate. I want you to see Jesus. I mean, I know it's Paul that's writing this letter, but I want you to see how Jesus advocates for us. Amen. So every good purpose and trait of character which you possess was due to the grace of Christ. This alone made him different from the perverse and the sinful. The same grace could make the debased criminal a child of God and a useful laborer in the gospel. Paul might have urged upon Philemon his duty as a Christian, but he chose rather the language of entreaty. Paul as the aged 
and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Amen. <laughs> when Jesus presents us to the Father, like he doesn't present us as somebody found on the street. No, you didn't. You didn't. You didn't get. No. Nope. He he doesn't present us as as somebody he met down the road. No. When Jesus presents us to the Father, when He advocates for us, He pre listen to the language of Paul. Begotten. Begotten in my bonds, as if Paul is saying, "I give birth." Let's continue. We want to see. Whom I have begun in my bonds, which in time past was to be unprofitable. Uh, the word unprofitable sounds a little tame to me. When, when, when Jesus says somebody is unprofitable, you know, and the next word that Jesus uses is wicked. Mm -hmm. The wicked and slothful servant. Mm -hmm. You are altogether unprofitable to me. So he was once wicked. Right? To defraud his master. So now, he was once unprofitable, but now, profitable to thee, but also to me. Oh, yeah. now, <laughs> I, I understand what Paul is saying. Paul is making the case for Onesimus. And he says, he's profitable to you. But he's also profitable to me. As if Paul is saying, listen, if you pass on him, I'll gladly take him. Amen. Doesn't, that, doesn't that increase the value of something? Oh, yes. Of course. Not just profitable to you. But he's profitable to me. In other words, I'm willing to keep him. The apostle asked Philemon, in view of the conversion of Onesimus, to receive the repentant slave as his own child, showing him such affection that he would choose to dwell with his former master, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. He expresses desire to retain Onesimus, as one who would minister to him in his bonds as Philemon himself would have done. Though he did not desire his service unless Philemon should of his own accord set him free. This is in Acts of the Apostles, page 456, all the way down to 458. All right? And I think that you should probably take time to go over this again because you will begin to see Jesus in a in a really fresh and new light. He will gain some understanding as to what is really how, how do I how am I set free or made free in in the court of heaven? Made righteous. You know, made righteous. Right? The apostle well knew the severity which masters exercised towards their slave. And he knew that Philemon was greatly licensed, oh, sorry, greatly incensed because of the conduct of his servant. And he tried to write to him in a way that would arouse his deepest and tenderest feelings. As a Christian, the conversion of Onesimus made him a brother in the faith. And any punishment inflicted on the new convert would be regarded by Paul as inflicted on himself. Paul voluntarily proposed to assume the debt of Onesimus in order that the guilty might be spared the disgrace of punishment and might again enjoy the privileges he had forfeited. Amen. Amen. Wow. 
So John says, if any man sin, we are an advocate. We have an advocate. Now, with a letter like this to Philemon, you think Philemon could do anything but accept Onesimus? Not as a slave, but as a brother? And as a co-laborer? Notice that Paul did not present the credentials of Onesimus. Paul presented his credentials and his life for Onesimus. And basically appealed to the righteousness that Philemon was now practicing for the freedom of Onesimus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Record this verse often. Very familiar passage. Verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Yes. Let us hold fast our profession. What do we profess? We profess to be children of God. So hold fast that profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And as a result of that, let us therefore come no, cowardly. Let us come sheepishly. Let us come with confidence. Not in ourselves. But let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In time of need. Which brings us to the point in time that we are today. We are living in the period of the closing of the investigative judgment. I'm not just yes. saying the investigative. I'm talking about the period of the closing yes. of the investigative judgment. And there are some things that we are to understand. Jesus would only advocate for those who he know. Amen. No, you probably didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. I want Jesus to advocate for me. Because I don't think he's going to lose a case. But Jesus is not going to take up a case unless he knows you and me. Mm. All right, mm -hmm. you, 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 you. <sighs> yeah. That passage of scripture talking about Jesus as high priest is talking about in heaven, the investigative judgment. In the judgment, this is now um, Great Controversy, page 486 to 488. All right, if you take a note. In the judgment, the use made of every talent will be scrutinized. I'm going to show you why we need an advocate. Hmm. The use made of every talent will be scrutinized. Hmm. How have we employed the capital lenders of heaven? Hmm. Will the Lord that is coming receive his own with usury? Have we improved on the powers entrusted us in hand and heart and brain to the glory of God and the blessing of the world? Have we used those things to the glory of God and the blessing of the world? 
how have we used our time, our pen, our voice, our money, our influence? What have we done for Christ in the person of the poor, the afflicted, the orphan, or the widow? No, this is all people who can't really help themselves too much. All right? The outcast, so to speak. And Jesus measures us, and we are measured by how we treat the poor, the widow, the afflicted, the orphan. God has made us the depository of his holy word. Yes? What have we done with the light and truth given us to make men wise unto salvation? No value is attached to mere profession of faith in Christ. No value is attached to mere profession of faith in Christ. Now I'm talking to me too. Only the love which is shown by works is counted genuine. Yet, it is love alone which in the sight of heaven makes any act valuable Amen. or value. Whatever it is done from love, however small it may appear in the estimation of men, is accepted and rewarded by God. Praise God. Glory. The hidden selfishness of men stands revealed in the book of, of heaven. The hidden selfishness of men stands revealed in the books of heaven. There is the record of unfulfilled duties to their fellow men, of forgetfulness of their Savior's claim. So we can't claim forgetfulness. There, they will see how often were given to Satan the time, thought, and strength that belong to Christ. Sad is the record which angels bear to heaven. Intelligent beings, professed followers of Christ, are absorbed in the acquirement of worldly possessions or the enjoyment of early pleasures. Money, time, and strength are sacrificed for display and self-indulgence, but few are the moments devoted to prayer and searching of the scriptures to humiliation of soul and confession of sin. Could you read from, from few? But few are the moments devoted to prayer, to searching of the scriptures, and humiliation of soul and confession of sin. So what does Satan then do? Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That they may not dwell upon the very work with which we are to be acquainted. We're talking about Jesus as an advocate. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view the atoning sacrifice of an all-powerful mediator. Now, this is the crux of the matter. Here is what he hates. He hates the great truths that bring to view the atoning sacrifice of an all-powerful mediator. He knows that with him, everything depends on diverting the mind from Jesus and his truth. This is Great Controversy, page 486 to 488. So what does this have to do with Jesus as an advocate? Every thing we do and say even the things that we should have done and said that we didn't is brought up in the courts of heaven. 
nothing is left out. An entire life record of deeds and actions and even motives is brought to scrutiny. And Jesus sits as advocate. Now Jesus could only be true. So in order for him to be our advocate, just like Onesimus, we have to become acquainted with him. Amen. Glory. Amen. And we have to minister to him. So that, so that, so that, when he presents us, he presents us as profitable Amen. to himself and to his father. And Jesus wants to be able to do that for every case. Amen. Because it's not only the propitiation for our sins, but for the sins of the world. See, they don't know. Yeah. But we do. Yeah. We have been exposed to all this light Amen. for so long. Mm -hmm. We dare not say or make the excuse that I did not know. Mm -hmm. Because we will not only hear the response for what we don't know or didn't do but what we had opportunity to have known and didn't know because every time we had opportunity goes and we didn't take advantage of the opportunity it goes a record against us yes. so as powerful a mediator and an advocate as Jesus is Jesus cannot mediate and advocate for somebody whom he does not know. And that is scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, 22 and 23. Let's go there, because we love to quote it. Matthew chapter 7. And after today, I hope that we would never see it the same again. 21, 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. How would you feel if you are depending upon a lawyer, an advocate, to plead your case? And that advocate or lawyer says, I don't know you. I'm saying, brethren, that we are at a serious message, time. Message, yes. message. Yes. I'm saying to us that we are on the brink of eternity. Amen. Jesus is soon to come, but he's coming for those whom he knows. Those who have ministered to him. When you read the account to this verse that we just read, Jesus said to his disciples, I was in prison and you visited me. I was um, naked and you clothed me. I was uh, hungry and you fed me. And they said, when saw we thee like this and, and ministered to thee? And this, he said to them, in as much as you have done it to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. So how do we cooperate with Christ? How? Here is what Paul, the key, and, 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 and John spoke of it, is having that personal relationship with Christ. Paul presented to Philemon the only, uh, you owe every good trait that you have 
you own to the grace of God. In other words, the grace of God first touch you. Before you can refresh anybody else, the grace of God must do something for you. Amen. And Satan is inventing all kinds of devices to keep us away from the great truths of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Central to our overcoming, our selfishness, is beholding Christ. What his sacrifice is and what it means to us. In other words, Jesus said, I will take the responsibility for them. If we do not respond to such a sacrifice, such love, isn't it an insult to God to call his name? I, I, do you understand, brethren? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It becomes a slap in his face to reject such a great sacrifice and then profess his name. Mm. And that's why Jesus said to those, I never knew you. Mm. I don't want to be a part of that. No. So we begin, we need to begin to look more on Jesus. Amen. Look more at Jesus. Spend a thoughtful hour each day. Thank you, Brother Shade. Each day, contemplating the life of Christ. Especially the closing scenes that the prophet says. Right? When we do this, this is what calls forth genuine love from our hearts. This is what literally ignites life into this dead stony heart of mine. And I can't do it once and say it covers all. No, I have to go daily. Stop looking at each other. Stop looking at the world. Mm -hmm. yes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yes. Yes. Look full in his wonderful face. Amen. Let the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And, grace. and as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will no longer see the, the minors, the falls of others. Because the closer we get to Jesus, is the more wretched we see ourselves. Amen. And we cling to him with pity yes. and determined effort. Saying, Lord, save me. Mm -hmm. Everything that we have done sinks into nothingness. Because we like to boast our knowledge and, you know, our... But all that means nothing when we behold the great sacrifice of Christ. I'm saying to you, to me, as we are that near, become like Jesus. Amen. Become like him. Yes. Now the prophet said that if when the when the when the preacher preaches and the truth hits home and there is conviction that We should give the people of God an opportunity to make decisions. Always make decisions. Because when we make decisions, it's recorded in heaven. So I'm going to give us opportunity. If you like me, want to say, Jesus, I want to behold you. Now and daily, give me fresh glimpses of thy beauty. Draw me to thyself that I would become like thee. If that is your desire, I'm just going to ask you to stand. Stand to your feet.
Well, that'd be an appropriate song. not presenting ourselves but presenting the righteousness the atoning blood Hallelujah. and the life of Jesus on the behalf of every bowing head here today and we are saying oh God that we want Jesus to be our advocate in the judgment therefore we consent even now Lord to cooperate with him and with heaven we want to know him for ourselves we want to hear his voice we want to see him we want to look upon him we want to handle him we want intimate and personal relationship every day with Jesus we want him to grow sweeter and sweeter as the day go by and you have promised that wherever two or three are gathered, touching anything, we ask, you will do it for us. We are more than two or three. And Lord, we agree that we need Jesus now more than ever. We need that personal relationship. And we ask, oh God, that you would pour your spirit upon us even now to form Jesus within. We no longer want, we cannot any longer be satisfied with the dry experience. The, the periodic highs and lows. No, we want to be ever with Jesus. We want to be constantly connected to him. So that we hear his voice saying this is the way. Walk ye in it. Lord, touch every heart every heart and as we make commitment to thee we are unable to fulfill it but we pray for grace even now for you said that we must come boldly before the throne of grace where we may find grace to help in the time of need so help us Lord help our frailty our words are just like ropes of sand our promises are like ropes of sand. We promise today and the next minute we break the promise, Lord. And only Jesus can give us strength. Lord, help us to continually lift our eyes, turn our eyes upon Jesus, to turn our eyes off of everything else and to turn our eyes upon Jesus. 
and may we by beholding become changed changed for now and changed for eternity yes this is our prayer oh god in this moment in jesus name we pray amen, amen. Yeah.